should get a start. And I'm very lucky because it's a very small group, so we might be able to actually talk, right? Um, what I would actually like to do is not do this kind of formal introduction that I would planned. We've been together for two days. I probably between us, we've covered most of the sessions. Personally, I'm exhausted with this much information. Um, but what I want to talk about with you today is that we can't actually make any progress in our work unless we've got a good grasp on the nature of the problem we're dealing with. So if we think about the talks we've heard over the past two days, I've noticed a number of things. Nobody, at least in the talks that I've been to, has been talking about what's called problems of simplicity, where you've got one or two variables. Like you go in a bank and you say, OK, I'll sort out the credit and, and debit. No one's talking about that, that kind of thing. I think it's because we know how to do it. I've not heard anyone talk really about what's called problems of disorganized complexity, which are problems of statistics and probability. I think it's because we know how to do it. We can do the math. So we can help a, a, a health company on death statistics or certain illnesses. Okay? Now, I just came from a talk uh, given by Linda where this was brought up. But the issue was not our ability to do the, compu the calculations. It was our inability to be real about ourselves, which is a very different problem. So in the last two days, I'm not seeing people talk about this. Either one of those simple problems or disorganized complexity problems. What I am seeing is incredible talks, actually all of the ones that I've been to, where what we're talking about are problems of organized complexity. Where, and this, these are, if you want, these are the biological problems, the life sciences problems, how does something grow, what, how does aging work, how does an organization adapt and evolve. We're talking about those kinds of problems. The words you, I've been hearing the last few days are organic, complex, emergence. There was a talk on self-organizing, um, distributed intelligence, nonlinear interaction. These kinds of words I've been hearing. <clears throat> so what's with this? Um, what I, so if you just think about those two, the two plenaries. So the first plenary was on how to scale Scrum. So that is classically one of these kinds of problems. So that's what we opened the whole conference with. How do we grow Scrum? How do we go from small teams to bigger teams? Okay. Uh, the plenary this morning was on what? With Mary. That was so long ago. <laughs> okay. But it was on how, you know, a lot of rules about the self-organizing sustainable groups, okay? And in these kinds of problems, it's not one or two variables, like your credit and debit system in a bank. It's not about counting billions, like in probability and statistics. These are problems where you've got a dozen, two dozen variables that interact non-linearly. And this is what we're having trouble with. So what I really want to discuss with you today is getting a handle on the nature of this problem, which has been at the root of all the talks I've heard in the last two days. But we're, no one yet has said, let's talk about the nature of the problem and how we're going to work with it. There is, however, a, <laughs> a common sort of commentary. Agile is aware of this. 
they're not comfortable with it, but they know that the waterfall stuff and the usual stuff is the wrong methodology. It's not going to get them there. There's an understanding that when we do this kind of anthropology, this was the Jeff talk, and you, you interview that strange creature, the client and the customer, and what is it they want, and do they know what they want? And there's a, someone brought up in the panel that lovely quote, old quote from Henry Ford. And Henry Ford said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they'd say, I want a faster horse. So how do, so there's an awareness that when you're dealing with a client, their needs, their ability to discuss their needs, our ability to predict how long it will take, we're in this world of organized complexity and dealing with the other. And sometimes the other is us. Okay. Um, it's come up in the last two days um, with design thinking. So one of the famous uh, design problems that you can find on, on YouTube is how EDO went about doing a shopping cart. And you look, it seems a simple object, but you've got a, a couple dozen variables if you're going to do that well. And actually, this is really pretty normal. So in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, we were working on one or two variables. Then we moved up to disorganized complexity, issues of stats and probabilities. And that where we are now, both, I think, in IT, if I judge from these two days, and in the scientific world, we're dealing with this organized complexity, nonlinear, a dozen, two dozen variables. That's the nature of the problem that we're struggling with. Now, <clears throat> our method, and I could get Linda to, to you know, stand up and give two more hours. Okay? So we've got to be as scientific as we can. So this collect your data, identify a variable you're working with, What's its relationship with other variables? Then you've got short segments. How do those work? Um, and of the talks, all the talks I've heard scout, you know, kind of dance around this. The one that, that I heard that I think is the clearest in these terms would be the one that uh, Linda gave yesterday on stereotype and prejudice. And I don't know how many of you were in that. Some of you, OK. So this idea that you can say, well, isn't that strange you, if you have male or female players on a computer game and you give them a female avatar, they act differently. So we're talking about variables which are context sensitive. Change the context, their behavior changes. You give people, you give students a math test. One group, they just do the test. Another group, it's fill out your name, your address, are you male or female. You get different results. You do that before you take the test. It changes the results. So we're talking about variables which are nonlinear, which are context sensitive, which makes it terribly difficult to work with well or work with easily. Um, but both in the panel and in both of Linda's talks, mm -hmm. I heard them as a plea for a more systematic kind of what is the hypothesis? What are we working on? And the, even the, the idea that experiment has now changed its meaning to mess around. <laughs> Just try it out. We've lost this kind of disciplined approach to analysis. So the first big idea that I, I want to leave with you is that we've got to get clear and articulate about the nature of the problem. And the second one is we're only as good as our tools. And much of what I've been hearing the last two days is kind of an agony about inadequate tools. So what I chose for this um, talk is to introduce to you a person you've probably never heard of, who's an English philosopher, J.G. Bennett. 
Any takers? Who's heard of J.G. Bennett? And you cheating. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's this philosopher, but uh, I kind of share with Linda, if you're having trouble in a domain here and making progress, look elsewhere, see what you can borrow, and bring it back in. So I'd like to offer up to you a brief introduction to J.G. Bennett. It's even briefer than brief. It's cherry picking tiny bits of it, which may be relevant. And then if you're interested, you can go and read the humongous work by J.G. Bennett. So <clears throat> Bennett's interesting because he's the only philosopher I know who's looking at this kind of methodology we, we're, we're struggling with and saying, OK, what would be the simplest bit? What would be the minimum segment that would contain conditionality and context sensitivity where we might be able to start to get a handle on this issue of organized complexity? So he's not attempting to solve the problem. He's attempting to make one organized step forward. So he says, all right, that we're going to work with triads. Um, and we're going to think of it as a plot, a little story that has three actors. His vocabulary is impulse. We'll have one impulse a force, a motivation, an agent that will act on another, which will receive that impulse, might take it on, might push it back, but receives it, okay? through the mediation of a third. Okay? So we've got actor, receiver, mediator. Three little players here. Okay? Three kinds of impulses, which is going to give us six possible modes of relationships or plots, okay? So, I don't know what happened to that, but that's all right. I don't want you to worry about that because it would give you a headache. <laughs> it was so nice, you're gonna worry about it later, okay? okay? But just to make our one hour easier, um, I've made up short little names that are memorable and then you can go back to the uh, more arid approach if you want, okay? So we'll go through the six, and if you'll note that they're in different order. So this first one is red, blue, green, then red, green, blue, then blue, red, green, then blue, green, red. But they the six modes are different relationships between the three. I don't know why this, these slides aren't, have moved around. All right, it's on, on we go. Um, of the six, <laughs> three of them have to do about maintaining stability in a system. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and we've heard a lot of them actually being discussed in the last couple of days, obviously not in this vocabulary. So let me go through those three, and then go through a, the second set of three that has to do with change. Okay. The first one we'll call automatic pilot. In fact, Mary actually used that expression this morning with her system one. When you're talking about self-governing uh, communities. Um, so an automatic pilot are things that we do every day with great regularity. And if you remember, Mary said, if we didn't have automatic habits, we couldn't get out of bed. Okay? So this underlying regularity, it makes our activities predictable, legible, even unnoticed. And it's, it's a set of interactions which creates absolutely nothing new. But what it does do is kind of facilitate these lower level tasks so that you can pay attention to the higher ones. All right, a few examples. Anybody, 
goes through the mediating technology of email, sends off a note to friends. An agile developer, through the mediating context of burn down charts, information radiators, and so on, which absorbs some of the cognitive load, helps you get to the next task easily. Um, who was it who confessed to going to McDonald's? <laughs> okay. But a famished McDonald's fan walks to the mediating familiarity of the layout and without thinking about it, just reaches for that wallet, knows the software, knows the tray, because it's on automatic pilot. Okay. And this kind of interaction is going to be key to all cultures based on simple transactions or business units based on simple tra transactions. Um, and so we want to be doing this or paying attention to this particular mode when we want to increase transparency or invisibility of the mediating tools in a system. So if we think, for example, some of the people here came from Bangalore, others from far away. Um, I came from far away. I simply, to get here, go on the web and order myself up some tickets, no sweat. Because it's all been done by the software world on automatic pilot. If I'm stuck in an airport, it's chaos because no one has done the next step, which is the automatic pilot of what do you do when a flight is canceled. But it could be done. So thinking about a client or a business unit or a need, what are the automatic pilots that we could be working on that would make life easier, this outcome thing? Um, a second one, and the Beatles are the f best example, where you've got the Beatles. I don't know if you know the, the history of the Beatles. Before they were the Beatles, and they had to take any gig they could get, they got a really creepy job in Hamburg in the red light district, where they had to play and play and play, out of which came the song Eight Days a Week. And so being forced to be in that mode of performance, they exhausted every trick they had, had to come up with new ones, and through that process, actually become the Beatles. Okay? So we have a mode of interaction between three variables, okay? which we can call the identity fades into view. Okay? You become who you are through this repetitive kind of action. A few examples. Um, in a motorcycle repair shop, here it would be the auto rickshaws. Okay. Uh, you get a little apprentice who becomes very sensitive, repeat exposure to the context of the smells and the sounds, and through that becomes an expert mechanic. You've got the programmer apprentice who through, complete, through repeated exposure to this context of retrospective stand-ups and so on, has a chance to become a talented developer. So this particular mode of the six are absolutely key to any kind of culture based on expertise. And the job here would be to increase opportunities for this plot or this kind of action to take place. Um, I'm looking forward to a talk tomorrow on gamification because this is what they've done extraordinarily well. They've understood that you scaffold it so as a player plays and plays and plays, it's never too hard. It's never too easy. There's always something new to go for. And through that repetition, you get this identity fades into view of the wonderful player. So games are extraordinary. There's something like 30 million hours of voluntary time 
have been given to this game. There's something here to be learned. And in particular, the people who need to learn it are school teachers, because we kill them. <laughs> we kill our students with boredom when there's so much that could be acquired from, from understanding that plot of three variables of identification fades into view. The third one here on this kind of stability side of it, okay, we're looking at situations of three variables which show us why the world cannot be capricious. We can't do just anything. Okay? So if we, for example, have a blood test, the, if you're going to handle the blood safely, you can't leave it on the windowsill in the heat. You can't drop it on the floor. So that requirement acts on the supervisor who writes the SOPs and the protocols who enforces that on employee behavior. We have a, a different kind of interaction from the three. Uh, we get a MIS report on a negative cash flow. So the boss says, you cannot go to Bangalore and spend money on a conference. You stay home. It changes the employee behavior. If I try McDonald again, you've got the guiding hand of McDonaldness, okay, which will influence the layout, which will give you a controlled customer behavior. Okay. So this is a plot in this kind of organized complexity that will be central to all the cultures based on, um, my goodness, what is wrong with the slides? Reglementation, OK? Right data, right form, right time to the right people. I've heard that. I haven't heard that in the last two days, though. <laughs> but I have heard it. Exactly that, OK. Um, so in our university, we have a program um, called audit, degree audit, which is supposed to allow students to go on and figure out exactly where they are in their studies, how many more credits they have to have, how much more English they have to have, how much more science they have to have before they can get the magic piece of paper. And I think the, the Ward Cunningham has been mentioned in a few talks. And actually, his, that was his definition of beauty, of aesthetics and programming, was a lock and key quality to the actual creation. So we got the cook, ingredients, surprising meal. We got a programmer. Let's say he uses a pattern. I picked publish and, and subscribe. So he gets a more elegant and habitable code. He creates something. And obviously, we need this for any cre uh, cultures of uh, innovation, change, improvement. Um, so let me give you this example, which surprised me. Actually, I got it from Dave. So what is this? It's an air, tra air traffic control. So in most air in airports, your biggest, and of course, that's a master control center. Okay? And in airports, that is your number one bottleneck to increasing efficiency and traffic in the airport. Okay? Are we going to let go of it? No. Okay? But there is one place which is in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where I've never been, where there is no air traffic control. Okay. And all the, the pilots use the publish and subscribe. <laughs> Get out of my way. But it works. Because you have this distributed intelligence. And you've got an elegant situation. So, so we're. We're moving from this kind of waterfall mechanic to something more of an organized complexity 
when we allow ourselves to do that. So if a plane is allowed to have an accident, so how we work? No, this is serious, OK? Mm -hmm. Ah, but I think the point that when I, I got this from example from Dave is that when they have air shows, they have incredible traffic and it still works. Everyone has a shared desire to not run into each other. Well, from what I know, there has been no crash. Do you want to answer? Okay, but that's not really your question is. So the answer would be, well, yes, it would. yes, it would. But it's, fright it's frightening. I mean, isn't that your reaction? Like, no, oh, no, we're not no. going to do that? See, it's exactly, uh, I, I like it. This, uh, you know that the biggest accident happened in, in JFK, and the pilots uh, there, uh, they worked in an assembly line. And then uh, the, there was no more uh, fuel, and the pilot was four hours trying to, to land. And then what happened? Uh, one uh, pilot, uh, one uh, uh, tower control guy there. Uh, oh, now I am about to leave and would say to the other, then he would get control. But uh, uh, ten guys were in this story until the last one uh, went, and they didn't say uh, to the guy that there was no more fuel in the plane. Okay, and then uh, the, uh, it was a plane from Bo Bo Bogota. And the, and the, the pilot said, uh, give me priority. Uh, I, I, I'm about to, to fall. Uh, and you see, in English, this was not tra translated as emergency. If he had to serve the protocol, he had to say, emergency, OK? So the, uh, the, 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 the plane crashed, killed hundreds of people, OK? And, and, and then what happened? Uh, no, no, no guy there was punished. This is the United States. You should see the movie, just avoid. Okay, I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah, All right. really. So, and see, then you say, yeah, as she said, if mm -hmm. everybody was here, you know, everybody would give uh, priority for the guy, right? Sure. So then it works better than humans working, it seems. Yes. Much more intelligent. Yes. And we can, I mean, there's been a lot of and talk. And the uh, work is there, right? Yes. Yes. Actually, to, to look at back to that, like many of the places we don't have regulation, we don't have traffic lights. We still manage to get past just because we coordinate at that point in time who is to go. Well, in the US, if you know, when you go for a four way intersection, there's always the first person who comes, he gets the right of way and do it. But we necessarily don't have the discipline here to understand from that process mechanics. But rather, we go and eye coordination is still built into it. Uh, we get by that without an accident. I mean, I'm saying that you know you may not have rules and constructs to it, but then there is a certain way people would organize around a certain complexity to get over that. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is this this idea of of well, of very simple rules, and each agent then acts according to very simple rules, which is what you see in the traffic around here. And then the system actually flows quite well without the centralized control. But in our businesses and organizations. We can't give up that centralized control. Psychologically, we can't give it up. Although we should. Okay. Yeah, this is the challenge. That's the challenge. Is <laughs> okay. So if I go to the second to last one, it's a, it, this is a plot where you have you, the initiator 
puts themselves in a receiving position okay, to a stronger force and something new happens. So the classic example, this is the plot of self-development. So this is the plot of all the mentoring and coaching we're looking at here, um, where we're going from actual to potential. This is the, um, the, the situation of the shrink, or the mentor and the coach. Okay. So patient concerned about her family, goes to see the psychiatrist, and you get an improved family life. It doesn't have to be nice, though. So the high school kid, we throw them in jail for drugs. They spend time in jail with a professional drug addict, and the result is increasing trafficking skills. Right? The, I mean, the, so the plots are neutral. You don't necessarily get beautiful results. Okay. Okay. Agile programmer <clears throat> submits to the wisdom of the on-site customer, the end user, and you get improved insight in the culture and tasks. So this would be <coughs> the, the three, the, the mode or the little plot that you need where you have constant evolution of skill base, this expression of always getting better rather than trying to be good all the time, a movement from actual to potential. Now most of the time this is, this is human to human. We can find cases where the computer is involved. So I took the example of Bush people trying to predict what was going to happen with the uh, effects of ending the tax cuts they'd put in place. We have computer power for calculating discrete rather than continuous. I'm sorry for the slides have gone bizarre. Um, and this gives us new mental models that we can work with. So we have a better, we have an increased potential here. Okay. And the, this last one, of the six, which we'll call release into new freedoms. I like this quote um, from Peter Block. It's a possibility where once, once a possibility has sur surfaced, you don't have to work on it. It will start to work on you. Okay? So two obvious examples. One would be Gandhi with his um, philosophy of the, the nonviolent resistance. And we can look at Facebook. So if we take Gandhi, you've got the nonviolent resistance, invites the police to reflect upon their own behavior, and new possibilities of justice surface, and they, in turn, then start to work on people around them. Pretty different world, but Facebook, so Facebook mediates exchanges. It acts on the receptive users. And what comes up are all kinds of new possibilities for marketing, which then become a force for acting on yet more changes. So that would be a very simple plot, basic to cultures of collaboration and constant change. Okay, uh, I think Ken Beck has come up not once an hour, but a fair amount. Okay. So we can use that, his vision of enough, okay, which would influence the developers and the clients. And so we wouldn't have to get into what uh, Craig talked about. What did he call it? The contract game. Who's, who's going to blame? Are you going to ask for more? Then you're going to negotiate for yes. If we could get this vision of enough, this was Ken Beck's idea, it would work, and out of that would emerge environments which would permit kind of methodologies, a wholeness, collaboration, which then in turn could start to become, and it would become an active agent. <clears throat> so there very briefly, you've got what um, Bennett calls the six modes, this kind of minimum set of variables that you can permutate in different ways and get these subtle, context-sensitive kinds of changes that we see in these organized complexity situations, growth, adaptation, 
evolution that we've been struggling with over the last two days, but we haven't got, we haven't yet got a way to do the scientific analysis of it. And then it could be helpful here. And what he argues is that if you're going to have a healthy culture, that could be the agile team itself, or it could be the business as a whole. But if you're going to have a healthy culture, all six of these plots, all six of these permutations have to be in existence and interacting with each other all the time. So this is what gives you the liveliness of a healthy agile team, a good business, and so on. They're all there, and you can watch them. I asked Linda if she would come. So I talked about Bennett's ideas to some software people in Minneapolis. They'd never heard of Bennett except one guy. And he said, oh, Bennett, I know Bennett. But it's not from software. It's because I study the guitar. <laughs> and his, uh, the methodology for learning the guitar had inspired their teaching and learning procedures from Bennett. So I was very surprised to see this programmer who said, oh yeah, I know Bennett, from learning the guitar. So I, I said, OK, I'll, we're going to India. It's not the guitar. We'll try, this. We'll try something else. Okay. But can we then use this as an example, which has the advantage of being extremely simple, because you can talk about the same variables as you go around and do the six. So I thought it'd be fun to have Linda because she knows not only software, it's because we're both 500 years old. <laughs> not quite, not quite. Okay. But if we just go back through those six with just the, the same variables all the time, you can start to see how this works. So <clears throat> you've got a player who by con but the, the automatic pilot Constant practice acquires the automatic pilot sk skills that you need to actually play. If you <clears throat> start the other way around, the gravity applies the limits of the instrument or the limits of the form, you get a controlled behavior outcome. If you <clears throat> take the player who submits to the superior force of the instrument, you're going to an intensification of skill. Straight creation, you get a player, you get an instrument, you get novel performances. Um, <clears throat> you can do it this way. You get the guy with uh, repeated exposure, leads to the affirming player. This is the, the Beatles scenario. You get the release on new freedom. It's the performance that acts on the musician, which gives you better sound. And musicians will tell you that a live performance is never the same as in the sound studio. Okay. It's, and it's because this is actually the plot that is in place. Okay. So I don't know if Linda wants to make a comment. So this was the, the one computer guy who had heard of Bennett, and it was through guitar. But he was saying, this is how they actually attempt to teach guitar and the various aspects of that um, activity in, a, in, a, in this kind of complex and whole way, trying to cover all the bases. Could I ask a clarifying question? Sure. And yeah. I'm trying, trying to figure out what kind of plot would apply to a retrospective. Yes. So if I go back to, if I can go back real quick. Just as a, an arbitrary. Um, hmm. It doesn't like this. So can you bring? How do you bring up that the star here? I just wanted to go back to the, the one of the star. No, way down here. 
fast, fast, fast. My, my PC pro, uh, PowerPoint doesn't like this faster. Yeah, so that's a good question. So basically what, what they're doing in this, in this guitar world is you're, you're using this as, a, as an inspiration model. You can't take it too far, but you can say, what, what are we not doing enough of? Where are we running into problems? Is there an imbalance? How, so so the, the guitar world is using it as a kind of a checklist, okay? saying, OK, we have to have automatic stuff in the learning of the guitar. You've got to have, if I go through the, the you know, the, you, you got to have this automatic pilot stuff. You've got to have a situation where they understand what the limits are, the gravity applies. You've got to have them do the Beatles things where they start to become themselves. And those three are grounding. But you also have to have in that music world, if it's jazz and improv, you've got to have the creation. You've got to have this intensification where you really submit to someone who does it really well. And you learn from them. And then you have to have what does the actual performance do to you? So they're using it for guitars. To, to get a certain kind of wholeness to it. And so the idea is, could you use that in software? Would it help you? Mm -hmm. hmm? So, so if, I, if, I, if I may, Doug, yes. uh, or maybe Linda can answer that uh, as the retrospective goddess that she is. <laughs> a thing. retrospective goddess. Now, there's a title. <laughs> I'm not, I don't, that's, I think it's a fine question. Um, let me give you my guess, but I'm not a retrospective goddess. <laughs> no. Okay, to, to me the retrospective obviously plays into the Beatles kind of thing where by exposure to retrospectives, you can actually become better because you go through it again and again. And like the Beatles, you exhaust your existing skills and you go for more. I would I understand what identity Yes. That's, that's, the, so the, that's the story. The Beatles, who at the beginning are just another ragtag bunch of teenagers who create a band. They aren't the Beatles when they start. Or McDonald's. McDonald's fine. Yes, that'll work. I would think intensification would be rather obvious in the retrospectives. But l let me turn it over to, to those who, because I'm not an uh, IT person. So Linda, what would be your guess to that question? Okay. And sometimes there, there can be kind of routine, and they are just repetition, where you're doing the Beatles identity phase into the thing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes retrospectives can actually be creative. Okay. Where what comes out of those are new ideas, mm -hmm. new uh, experiments, or new exploration. Yeah, the gravity applies, and you get the hammer on the toe. Okay, uh, and, and it can be an increase in automatic pilot. You just start to learn it. Okay. So I would say that all of these apply to all of the agile practices, and you, you don't want to put them into the practice themselves. But they're, they're, it's a kind of like a transformation model. You could use it between going from shu to ha, from ha to re. That, okay. That you at some point, you've got, you've got to do all of those to become self, to become balanced, for, for balanced growth. Exactly. Okay. And in my own just kind of playing around with this, I find it, I find it useful in thinking through sick situations. Okay. And you say, all right, what's, what's, something's wrong here. 
and it helps me think through so more precisely what is wrong and therefore what can I do about it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so my question to you is, can you, could you use this as a transformation model or as a check? I don't like checklists, that's very mechanical. But as a way of thinking about context sensitive variables and how you at a very fine grain level can start to tweak them. Because in the talks we've heard the last few days, what people are talking about for the most part is a lot of fine grain stuff. How do you get out of the contract game? How do you get out of, what did he call it, that secret box of stuff of, well, we'll put it in the fix it later rather than talk about it now. So, and that's really fairly fine grain. But when you talk about life, life systems, living systems, you're talking about this fine grain, non-mechanical kinds of interaction. So, so in addressing this, this kind of problem of the dozen variables, two dozen variables, we're missing tools, and this is the best thing I've come across, that might serve us in thinking through it more systematically and not just messing around as we've been doing. Okay. I can give you another couple of examples, but are there other questions or comments on the kind of basic here? Just brilliant. Brilliant, okay. But yeah, Bennett's brilliant. But you are brilliant to Okay. I'm brilliant to bring you brilliant Bennett. Okay. Uh, yeah, I no. wish I could be that definite. Uh, I've got a, a tip of the tongue feeling where this almost makes sense. Okay. But not quite. All right. And so one of the, one of the things that I'm confused about is uh, I have no idea yet how, how to assign those three roles to, to anything. So, so could you say more about those three so that there's actor, uh, mediation, and receiver. Is that it? Yes. Uh, OK, let me, try, let me try this. So maybe it's because I'm an engineer. And <coughs> yeah, and I'm an architect, so you think <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can bridge the gap. No, no, really. For me, it's okay. just brilliant. And architects get inspired when you talk to them. OK. So let's, but let's try this for long. So um, what Bennett's talking about is, is, so you've got these six little plots with three characters. Okay? But that's not enough, because you also have to do the relationships between the six plots. Okay? So you get this dance that the, the guitar people are developing. Okay? Um, so let me give you a couple of examples. Okay. Um, the, I don't know if you've heard of Open University. Okay. So they had an old website. So there's the student who goes to the website and gets their chosen courses. Okay. But the old, the old website was the classic, here's the Department of Math, here's Chemistry, here's Computer Science, here's the, here are the fall semester classes, and so you just go by um, school, department, class offering, okay? Um, so that's red, green, blue. We bring in a designer of user experience who watches the students operate on the website to choose their classes, gets an understanding of the student behavior. So you've got blue, red, green. He comes, the designer then becomes the actor designer. So you get a red, blue, green. So the designer then comes up with a new website, which is, starts with the student and says, who are you, what do you want, and what have you had already? And only th then the student picks the course. But this website is not in the least bit organized like the old one. So you've got a very different um, organization. But when you look at that change process, you get <laughs> different initiators in each one. So here it's the student doing it, here it's the designer, um, the designer, then the student. So you get a, you can track at a fine grain level the, the
the kinds of changes. Well, let me try this story, see if it works. Um, so this is a true story. I'm appalled by the slides, who worked beautifully at home. Um, so this is a story about Paul. This is a true story. So we've got Paul the programmer, an automatic pilot who goes to his bank to get a loan for a new car. Okay? The loan officer is very nice, and he says, yes, you can have a loan. Okay? Paul sees that his company could automate all the forms on the loan, which is a brilliant idea. So, so you can see each one is a different plot. Okay? Works out with his agile team, Beatles style, how to do it. Pitches the idea to the bank. You'll make money, you'll have customer satisfaction, blah, blah, blah. Okay? But Paul is still thinking like the mechanical Turk and just calculating rather than being organic. And he hasn't done his, this particular um, triad. So <clears throat> he has not actually listened to the loan officer, which is the only way he can get a culturally appropriate software. What happens is the loan officer says, oh, over my dead body are you doing this? It will eliminate my job. Okay. So the loan officer gets very creative. We get creative fighting. Um, they manage to control the hierarchy. They refuse to innovate. They do not use Paul's idea. Okay. So it's the cultural gravity applies. Because we avoided the requirements of the existing culture, we bury it. And there's Paul. And that's, in, in the things that I've heard in the last two days, that uh, intensification triad has been the most problematic and the most talked about. That under, this either understanding self or understanding and client, which would be that, that one loop. If I had to look at anything I've heard to, you know, in the last couple of days, that would be the weak spot or the agony spot, doing the right thing. And then in that panel discussion, Linda says, God, are we going to go talk about this again? <sighs> yeah, because that's, that's the weak spot, that intensification one, and what I've heard. Okay. Now, let me go back to, well, let's go back to Lawrence. So we can, does that help, or do you still need more kind of going through them? It took me months to kind of. <laughs> um, no, actually, it took me a long time. I was constantly going back. Now, wait a minute. Who's on first? Who's on second? Who's on third? <laughs> it's red. It's blue. It's green. No, let's see. Until I got, I kind of got the hang of it. So you're not going to get a, the hang of it in an hour. Right. Okay, but if you leave with the tip of the tongue, actually, I'm already pretty happy. <laughs> because it's, I mean, it's, uh, to be able to manipulate it with ease takes a fair amount of work. Um, but my question to you is, so I don't know what you guys, so I'm telling you what I've heard over the last couple of days, is this kind of agony, not about simple problems, not about calculations, but about this multiple variable interaction mess and a, and a difficulty in a, addressing it cleanly. So that's what I'd like feedback from you guys on.
Mm-hmm. I, guess, I guess any of us could tell you a complete story, uh, I mean, a complete uh, you know, epic or something like that. You know, what's going on at this place that I work? Mm-hmm. And then you, you might be able to see the, you know, the, to see the plots in, in various places. Right. Uh, it's, it's hard to come up now on the spot with you know, anything that's recognizably one of those. Yes. Um, and actually, I was intrigued with the guitar players because there is a culture of learning, mentoring, coaching based on, on, these, on these six plots. And the, the guy who knows the guitar system says, yeah, you know, there, there is a transferability from learning that music to learning programming and learning to interact in an agile world. Okay. And one of the fun things about a conference is that you can play around with new ideas. Well, I've seen some pretty bad buildings by architects who didn't understand the engineering. <laughs> no, no, yeah, well, but uh, in first, as far as I know, in first world countries, it's impossible to have any, uh, uh, any project that uh, the architect is not the, the, the boss, the chief, okay? For example, in Brazil, oh, architects are, uh, are not important. Engineers are the, the chief and lots of problems happen. So, and then I'm just uh, uh, angry uh, uh, with this, and it's the fault of the architects, of course. Okay, well, that, I mean, that takes us pretty, pretty far afield. Yeah, far yeah. afield, but uh, it's the, yeah. the, the, the... And actually, I think we could, we could learn some interesting design from a really good engineer. No, no, but uh, the, 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 uh, you see, uh, uh, the role of the engineer uh, is uh, mainly... Of course, it's fundamental. You have to go uh, against the, the weight of gravity, okay? And the role of the architect is to respect this and fly over. Uh, of course, the bad architects ignore this and then it's a disaster, but mm-hmm. it's not architecture, okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's bad architecture. Yeah. So, <clears throat> actually, now we, I was kind of intrigued by the panel session because it's the only session where the audience was running the show. And I rather, I rather liked it. So we've got just one or two more minutes, but from the quiet people out there, are there any questions or comments that you want to ask? What was the name again of, of the person? Is it Bennett? Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T. So initials in J-B. 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 I missed the beginning, so yeah, yeah. Okay. J-B Bennett? J-G Bennett. Mm-hmm. Okay. He's an English, English philosopher English who died, I guess, about... Uh, 15 years ago. Oh, I like this philosophy. This is great. Okay. Okay. His main work. Okay. That was very interesting. I'm a programmer as well, and I'm also, you know, agile as well. I can be an architect as well. You don't have to lock people into different roles. You can be whatever you want to be. Different situations, you can have different goals as well. You know, so I don't agree with you, but you know, it's, it's no, yeah. No, you didn't agree because you didn't interact, but you interact. 
Okay. If you, but if you're interested, his, the, the main work is systemics. Um, there's, there's, there's Wikipedia stuff. Uh, it's not terribly good. But, I mean, you can get something of an idea out there. All right. Well, thank you for your attention. And if it moves from the tip of the tongue to a real idea, let me know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.